So when I first came to Cardinal Newman High School, I was told to do about 25 or 24 hours of community service. And I've never done community service in my life. And I really did not want to. I mean, why would any 15-year-old? When I thought of community service for the first time, I mean, I thought of being an inmate, picking up community service, like trash in a park. And it was not the mumbo jumbo they told us in class about making a difference in the world or you know, getting real learning outside the classroom. No, I was not happy knowing I would have to do work outside the classroom along with my homework. Now, um, I finished 24 hours, you know, doing what most freshmen do, going to the Redwood Empire Food Bank, showing up, being told what to do. I was only there because I had to be. The next thing I know, I have this thing called a CBSL project community-based service learning, where you have to do all these beautiful things to prove that you actually did your work. <laughs> now I had no idea what I was going to do. And, you know, I, call, I told my parents, like, I have this project and I have no idea what I'm going to do. You know, he's like, oh, I know someone. He made the call, you know, I was set with my project. Not really interested. And so, how did I come to care about all of what I've done? Well, I met with my mentor, Valerie Kumra, who works with Love Manifest, and she travels to impoverished and remote parts of India to provide wells for villages or create medical clinics, and there's so much more, but we're not getting into it. Now, I, each student gets to pick and create their own project that they want to do, and when it came to my project, I have traveled to India before, and so, one thing that stood out to me was not being able to drink the water because it could harm me. Now these people live with that fear every day that their next drink could kill them. So I decided I wanted to put a well in a, in a village. So the more we talked about it, the more interested I became in my, with my project. And you know, I, even though I was blind going into it, I really created a care. Now, the day that I traveled there was literally the longest day of my life. We were on the flight for 18 hours, and we still landed midday. So when we got there, we all got off the plane, either being tired or hungry, and we walked outside, and to our surprise, we saw the orphanage children standing there, ready to welcome us into their country. Now, they were wearing these uniforms, the small, brown and red materials, and they were standing there with no shoes. They were standing on gravel with no shoes. Now, when I was young, I didn't even like, I had to wear shoes, even inside. Now, I suddenly noticed that my eyes were watering, and there was a burning in my nose and my throat, and it wasn't because I'd come to an emotional state, no. It was because there were people a couple yards from us burning their trash. I suddenly like, started to take in my awareness of what was around me. I saw people laying on the ground with no clothes on. And some were really hard to look at. And you know, they would look back at me and smile. And they didn't have any teeth. And it was really hard to smile back at them and make that connection. But yet they were so happy. Now these kids were the happiest kids I have ever met in my life. They hugged us and welcomed to us to our country. You know, we leaned down, they put flowers around us. And we couldn't communicate with them because they were speaking in Tamil. But yet we felt as if there was no need to because our presence was enough to signify our love for them. I didn't expect that when we got off the bus, when we went to the next village, or the first village where the first love manifest well was, that everybody would be there, old, young, sick, and if they couldn't walk, they were being carried by their family. I didn't expect that what we were doing was making that big of an impact on their lives. You know, some were crying, some were playing the drums, and I was super overwhelmed because we had just gotten there, we haven't slept, and yet we were thrown into the middle of this village where they're playing the drums, they're dancing for us, they're crying and we're celebrating what we've done. And we were so taken by what we were seeing, and we had hands-on, real learning outside the classroom. 
all that mumbo jumbo that they did talk about. So we went to the Love Manifest Orphanage, which operates on just 10, a little under $10,000 a year to educate within 50 to 60 students. That's less than $250 per student to feed, clothes, house, along not to mention maintenance of the building, pay the teachers. Now, one student at the village, her name was Lucia, she didn't live at the orphanage. She actually lived on the street with her family. And you know, they taught her how to beg. And so when I was there, we were playing with them on their new playground that we installed. And you know, she used every trick in the book on me to get me to give her new pencils, balloons, candy, and paint her nails. And I never gave in because I knew it was wrong to reward her for this kind of behavior. So she would give me the biggest puppy eye look, and I still wouldn't give in. It was pretty cute. But she was pretty smart and caught on. So at the very end, she said, when we said goodbye, she you know, hugged me so tight that she wouldn't let go. And then I slid the nail polish into her pocket, and then she said, goodbye, sister. And she didn't notice it until I got on the bus. But when she did, she gave me the biggest smile. The next day when we went to the next village, we noticed quite a big cultural difference. One of the members of my team decided to donate an Indian-style toilet. Now this is what an Indian-style toilet looks like. You know, you pretty much squat down and do your business. To us, that seems preposterous and not to mention gross. And so I asked my mentor, why do they choose this way over the Western-style toilet? And you know, she answered the same reason we, why we choose our way over theirs. You know, we say our way is right. They say their way is right. And the first time I went to India, to be honest, I had no idea about cultural differences. I assumed wearing skinny jeans was OK. Not to mention it was 110 degrees out, so shorts seemed logical, right? No. Way wrong. I assumed they were taking pictures of me because I was the only white girl in the crowd. No, they were taking pictures of me because my legs were showing. Now, when I came back to my, my middle school teacher, Dr. Egan, explained to me that they did this to his wife too. And he asked his friend who originally lived in India why they did this. And he explained that in India, they believe that a woman's body is her temple and she's the goddess. And that if she's showing off her body, it's disrespecting her. So I never had thought about it that way. And so this was a big cultural difference that came to my mind, knowing that here we don't, believe, we don't see it that way. Now don't think that I'm talking about religion or wearing a burqa and not showing any bit of skin. No, I'm talking about the difference of cultural difference between how they view the human body. Now, I noticed this difference and was interested by it because I'd never looked at it that way. Now, when we visited the Love Manifest Orphanage, we noticed that we wanted to do more. We, it was hard to sleep at night knowing that some of the kids at the orphanage couldn't sleep on a bed. And when we gave them their food, we fed them lunch. It was on their hands like this, and we gave them one spoonful. We asked Father Donna, who works there, if we could do more, because we knew we wanted to help. And you know what he said to me? Is he said, no. They refused our help. And we wanted to do whatever it took to get them what they needed. But that's where we went wrong. They did not need it. They're being educated because of us. They actually got new uniforms because of us. And they're being given these things while they're not working for it. And Father Donna explained to us that in India, if you're giving these children these things, that when they get out into the real world, they're not going to be given these things. They're going to have to work for it. They have to learn that they need to work for it because it's not going to be given to them. 
Now, what truly amazed me was how someone with what seems like to be so little could be so happy. Now, these people were happy all the time, always smiling. And I remember, now if you go down to like San Francisco, <laughs> try smiling at someone and waving as you're walking down the street because they'll probably look at you weird. I remember coming back, wanting to wave at every kid I saw, because when we were there, every kid, every person, no matter what age, was smiling and waving. But if you did that here, it's like, what the heck are you doing waving at my kid? Like, now, I can't even explain how different it is there and to see that they've achieved what some, one might call true happiness. I won't forget this trip ever, because it's real learning. Now, we all have different definitions of real learning. You might think it's what you learn in a classroom, what you learn by your parents, or something as simple as be learning to live on your own. But real learning to me isn't just taught by your parents or taught in a classroom. Real learning is best experienced by going into the real world and helping real people after you find a real need. I experienced lessons that could have never been taught in a classroom. I came to care about what I had learned, and I wanted to make a difference in someone's life. Now, the memories that we, we created with the orphans will last their entire lives. I found a real need, and I took action. Most of all, I discovered what real learning means to me. So go find out what real learning means to you and what you care about most and take action. And know that there's no limitations to what you can learn on your own, and that is not limited. Knowledge is free. Thank you.